Thank you, Sandy. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, audience participation. I need that. <laughs> um, welcome to the, uh, I think we're in the Monte Cristo 3-4 meat locker. I think that's the name of this room. Um, there will be cold cuts handed out afterwards. Um, and I need to point out that the jokes aren't going to get any better. So if you need to laugh, you're going to have to grab these opportunities when they come up, OK? Thanks. So we're here to talk about the uh, Internet to EDUCAUSE eTex pilot that um, uh, Mark's institution and my institution are both participating in here this semester. And we're, we're learning on the go. And we're here to provide you with a little bit of information on what we've learned so far. And it's, it's been an interesting ride, I think, uh, is, is a good way to sum it up. Um, this all started um, as a project at Indiana University, actually, a couple of years ago, and morphed into a uh, pilot in the spring of 2012 um, that included five institutions. Let's see, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, University of Minnesota, Indiana, uh, Cornell, and uh, Virginia, I believe, are the five. And they ran that pilot here uh, over the uh, course of the spring 2012 semester. And I'll get into the details of what the pilot means there in just a minute. Uh, for the fall semester, Internet2 expanded that uh, to up to 50 institutions that uh, could participate. And so uh, Wichita State and Iowa State are two of, of the schools that, that got into the pilot. Uh, basically what it means for a fee that the institution is paying, uh, in our case a $20,000 fee, uh, we get up to 20 course sections that can be included in the pilot or up to 800 students, whichever comes first. And the students that are in the pilot then get a free e-text from the publisher. So if you divide that out, $20,000 fee, 800 students, you're basically talking about $25 per e-text. There's also another level that was involved. You could uh, also pay up to $35,000 and get double that capacity. But I think most of the schools stayed with the, the, the $20,000, the lower option. Um, the Internet, too, is doing a lot of stuff with cloud-based providers uh, right now. And this is just part of their Net Plus services that they're trying to provide. If you're paying attention to what that organization does, um, they have a number of cloud-based services that they're trying to basically bulk buy for their member institutions anywhere from storage to PBX replacement, e-text. And earlier this week at their uh, conference out in Philadelphia, they announced uh, a couple other uh, uh, cloud-based products in the learning tools range, including infra, uh, Instructure Canvas and, uh, and a couple other learning tools are now available through Internet, too, on a bulk buy, if you remember. So they're really trying to be aggressive about cloud-based sourcing, which uh, is an interesting um, direction for a professional organization, I think. Um, so all the students in, in the pilot um, are getting a free e-text and free access to McGraw-Hill Connect. Now let me explain a little bit about what these differences are. And I'm going to go back to my idea of an e-text, which might be a naive idea of, a, of an e-text. But um, I'm picturing this electronic resource that's laid out in front of me on my screen. It's got lots of great links and resources. It has rich media. It has demonstrations, it has animations, it has all kinds of things that my printed textbook cannot have. Well, that's really not what we're seeing at this point. So what a number of publishers, McGraw-Hill is no different, and a number of other publishers are doing this the same way. They're taking the print version of the textbook, essentially providing this in electronic format, and taking all that rich media 
and sticking it over in this thing called Connect, which I'm sort of loosely referring to as an e-publishing system. Different publishers have different names. Pearson is My Labs Plus and, uh, and so on. Um, basically, all the things that I remember from college that were in the back of the text, all the supplemental readings, sort of the, uh, the uh, worksheets that I might do to sort of test my ability and my understanding, actually the quizzes that might be in the back, all of that is migrating to this Connect-based system. Oh, by the way, did I mention there's another fee for that? So this is an interesting direction that the publishers are taking us on, and it's uh, uh, certainly a very confused space right now, causing a lot of problems with bookstores at our institutions and with our students. So what, now I'm coming back full circle, what this pilot gets us is access to the e-text that the faculty member has selected, and if there's a connect component for that e-text, the students get free access to that. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the technology. Um, course Load is the name of a vendor that uh, provides an e-reader. This is not a hardware-based solution. This is software. Works in a browser, HTML5. We've actually got a little bit of a, a poop sheet up here that Mark's going to pass around if you're interested. Um, this is software that uses um, LTI compatibility, learning tools, interoperability. So it has the ability to hook into your course management system utilize that authentication mechanism as a pass-through to get to their cloud-based service. A relatively um, slick way to, to do that, and I'm really glad to see LTI integration happening and popping up in a lot of other places. Course Load is um, the brainchild of four different publishing companies, and so what you're really seeing here is the publishing industry creating a company by which their, their e-text can be read. So just be aware that those companies have relationship. Um, there's some social uh, functionality within uh, course load. Mark's going to talk a, a bit about that later, but there's some interesting things that you can do beyond highlighting and, and annotating the electronic text, which you can do. Um, the faculty member has the ability to add stacks of information, so there's potential to add some additional content from that faculty member. Um, so there's, there's some interesting things that course load will allow. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the timeline uh, for this. Um, so I got word after a meeting of uh, some research university CIOs uh, late March of this year that this pilot was coming and we ought to be looking out for it. And it was in late March that a notification went out and hit a bunch of listservs, EDUCAUSE and I2 listservs that you might have seen. Um, we had to attend an informational meeting that Internet2 was uh, coordinating and then we had to uh, make a commitment on basically a two-page terms of service um, uh, document that uh, had, we had to commit to by the third week of April and the Internet 2 would provide to us whether we're actually in the pilot or not shortly thereafter. Now think about that a minute. When do your faculty have to have their textbook adoptions into your bookstore? Long before April. So we're already behind the eight ball on this and that's probably a part of the reason why Internet 2 is looking for 50 institutions to participate in the pilot and there are actually only 25. So part of it was the lateness uh, of getting this thing rolling, and part of it was that a number of institutions, particularly those that have a Barnes & Noble type relationship for their bookstore, suddenly found that in their contract with these Barnes & Noble types that there was an exclusivity agreement, and so they could not get an e-text from anywhere else, and so automatically all those institutions, unless they were smart enough to negotiate that out, could not participate in the pilot. So they ran into some interesting legal stuff that kind of was a barrier there. Um, so we're, we started in the faculty recruitment process. We, we both get notified somewhere around uh, late April that we're in. Started in the faculty recruitment, send out some information, find that it's actually pretty painful to get faculty to agree to do this, uh, which I guess maybe we should have known in hindsight, but I don't know how long it took, Mark, uh, I think it was a little bit shorter time frame, but we actually got into early July before we reached capacity of our pilot, and we were working pretty hard to get that. Now, another part of the timeline here is that, you know, we're trying to reach faculty, and if they're nine-month uh, employees, then they're not home. And so, again, there's, there's an issue here with, with the timeline. But eventually everything works out. We get uh, books loaded, so McGraw-Hill provides the e-text to course load and then course load loads that into our Blackboard instance and so the, the way the student views this is they simply log into Blackboard or whatever LMS that they happen to be using and it's the e-text is literally just sitting there in the course materials in their Blackboard course. 
They click on it, there's a little bit of a, uh, there's a launch button that actually shoots them through into the cloud-based instance of course load. There's the e-text. We actually did nothing to load the text. This all happened behind the scenes with the vendors. So the uh, semester starts middle of August for both of us. We're about seven or eight weeks into it. Um, we are also entering into some assessment phases, and we'll cover that here in a little bit. And then the pilot ends, December of this year. And oh, by the way, unless you selected the print option, you're going to lose access to that e-text as soon as the semester ends. So we have been aggressively telling our students to please select, if you want to have this, um, a copy of the e-text into the future, please, please select the print on demand button, which is available in course load, and they do get a, a print copy uh, of that text, um, depending upon the size, either 28 or $34. So it's still relatively low cost for the students. And considering that they've gotten it free to begin with, hopefully that's not too much of a burden for them. It, you can also print from, from course load just sections if you want to without having to go through that service. Um, and I think we're moving yeah. on to rationale. Okay. Well, I'm going to take a, the lead on this part. Well, also, just to let you know, I'll show you a demo of course load so you'll be able to see the pass through, you'll see some of the other features of it. Um, we'll do that towards the end of our presentation today. The rationale for participation, let's start off with uh, Wichita State University. Uh, ETEX e had been in limited use through the library. It's been largely library based initiatives at, at any cost. There were, say, an individual faculty member might have purchased or told the students they can purchase an ETEX as an option for their class. But overall, we don't have any kind of e-text presence on campus and so between the chief information officer and the provost they decided that they wanted to participate in order to um, kind of help be a part of shaping the future of technology. Our, our CIO is very interested in being kind of a, a technology hub especially for Kansas. Um, so that's one of his major initiatives is to try to get on board things early. Um, so that's kind of our rationale. And okay. I'll turn it over to you. Well, I, at Iowa State, we uh, very similar. Um, basically, e-texts are something we're going to deal with in the future. I don't think anybody disputes that. You could dispute what it's going to look like. You can talk about what the timelines may be five or ten years down the road. And I, I sure don't have the crystal ball on, on any of that. But eventually, we're going to have to deal with this. And so it was important for us to participate at a level where we could actually start to see some of the issues from the get-go and actually be at the table for a discussion. So we came up with three basic goals, and I'll do them in sort of David Letterman style of uh, top ten, or in this case top three. And, and our third one is actually seeing how the e-text impacts the learning and teaching process. And you might be thinking, well, isn't that what we're most engaged in? Why isn't that your first goal? Well, actually there's a couple other things that are more important to us, frankly. Um, and we are going to do some assessment on the teaching and learning side. Our second goal is, frankly, to see how it impacts institutional processes. This is a major change for our bookstore. This is a significant change for disability services. Um, there's some interesting legal implications here. We need to get that figured out, actually, before we can start to figure out how the implications are going to impact teaching and learning. At least that's, uh, that's our direction on it. But more importantly, the top goal that we've got is that we wanted to have the dialogue on campus. All of us in here pay attention to what we're all doing at, at different institutions. And so you can go back and you can say, hey, I heard this presentation by a couple of bozos about e-text. I'm sorry, <laughs> one bozo and an expert on, um, on e-text. And you can start to tell people about what the findings might be. But you're likely not going to have the conversation at the provost level. You're not going to have it at the bookstore level. You're not going to have it at a lot of different levels unless you actually do the pilot on your own campus. And so I'm a big believer of not being a voyeur, uh, actually getting in and participating. And so goal number one for us was simply to have the campus dialogue. Um, institutional team structures, we set up a, a really very cumbersome, actually, team structure. Um, we've got 15 people that participate in an oversight committee. It includes people from our um, uh, legal offices, purchasing, bookstore, our library, basically anybody who this might impact from a business process standpoint. Now, not all of those people are necessarily actively engaged, but they're being informed as we go along. There's really just six people that are the heavy lifters um, uh, on this project, and they're the people from my shop in IT and the people from our Center for Teaching Excellence uh, who are actually helping the faculty utilize this product. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how our structure looks like, I guess. At Wichita State, it's been a lot more loosely organized. Um, I'm it. <laughs> Uh, 
I, luckily, I have a committee. Yeah, I'm the committee of one. <laughs> Uh, so with me, it's been you know having to get permission to do particular things is having to mean meaning I have to go to different people and say, can we do this? Can we do that? And it's it's a little it's a, it's a it's troublesome. So you've got the extremes. You've got one person running everything or a committee of a million running it. And I there needs to be a happy medium where you've got people who are involved in that. So I've been able to after we've kind of got going. Uh, talk to some of these different people, like get general counsel involved with advice, uh, disability services we've gone to for advice and for making sure that we're compliant um, and making sure proactively that we don't have any students in any of these courses that are going to need assistive technology um, because of the limitations of the technology itself. And then the library um, is another one that we have a good relationship with, luckily, so I was able to kind of get them show them at least in the beginning what's going on. We have not had a sit down dialogue with all of these people yet. We're actually gonna have that next week on Wednesday. And so we're looking at it from how are things standing now and what are we gonna do into the future. So um, next is the biggest point is what is the role of the bookstore in this? In each one of the pilots they've all asked this question and many people are in the same boat that we are that we jumped into this pilot without even talking to the bookstore. So we were pretty much committed before even having a first conversation with them. Um, initially, they had nothing to do, so we realized that we needed their help. Um, we weren't getting names of instructors who were using McGraw Hill text from McGraw Hill for whatever reason, and so we decided we needed to find out from the bookstore themselves, but we needed to have a sit-down conversation with them first. We did, and, it, and surprisingly, they were on board. They said, we see that there's a future happening and we need to be a part of it. We can't be behind things. So I was very pleased with how our bookstore responded. It could have gone a lot worse. So. Um, somewhat similar story. Um, we did sign on to the pilot before we had our first engagement with the bookstore. That did create some um, collateral damage that we had to go back and fix. Uh, our bookstore, probably not unlike many of yours, is complete cost recovery. And so one of the main things they're looking at that's a legitimate concern from them is that I've just taken 20 courses out of their portfolio of sales and they have no revenue now for those courses. So that's a legitimate concern. Other concerns that came up I suspect were a little bit more turf based and a little bit more concerned about what's this evolving pilot um, doing to the business model between publishers and the bookstores uh, and the universities and, and including the faculty. And those are some interesting questions and, and hopefully we're having more discussion about reality than fear, but I, I think fear probably comes in periodically as well. Um, and I, you know, we had difficulty getting good response from the McGraw-Hill reps on campus, who we were all told would be able to help us with that problem, but if you think about it, we're, we're impacting their, um, their sales margin as well. So some of them were maybe not quite so helpful with that. In the end, what we had to do, because we were so late into the process, um, in uh, adoption, a number of faculty had already submitted their faculty adoptions for the fall semester. We had to agree that whatever um, our bookstore had bought back for the fall semester, that course, if they'd done significant buyback for that course, that course was not going to be eligible for the pilot because they'd already made an, a commitment uh, on, on uh, sales income and they needed to be able to count on redistributing those texts. Once we made that commitment, we were good to go with them and they were actually pretty helpful in doing faculty recruitment, but it did take away an awful lot of courses that we, we couldn't engage with. So we did get the, to, the, to the threshold eventually, but it, it, it took some work. Okay, faculty selection process. Uh, for us, it was a shotgun approach. I, I hope everybody here appreciates the <laughs> shotgun, Mike. I know that's not the shotgun that most people refer to, but... Um, told you you got to laugh when you get a chance, people. <laughs> so it was really a shotgun approach. We tried to communicate to our faculty uh, in early May. Think about the time frame. It's our finals week. They're heading out the door for summer vacation. And the resounding response I got was <laughs> not much. I had a number of people uh, uh, ask me, oh, this is really cool. Can you do it for Cengage? Can you do it for Pearson? Sorry, McGraw-Hill is the only participant, at least for the fall 2012 semester. By the way, Internet2 has announced a new round for the spring 2013, and there are more publishers involved, and there are more programs. But for this semester, it's just McGraw-Hill. So 
we had our, uh, McGraw-Hill then told us that they would help us do faculty recruitment, and they sent us a number of names, a long list, uh, probably 40 different faculty, and said, I bet all these people would be interested. Now, either through smarts or luck, probably the latter, I looped in our bookstore before I started walking down that list and found out that every single faculty member on the list was not a McGraw-Hill user. So they were trying to get us to help them convert faculty over to their product, which I refused to do. And there was a terse note that went back to them, and I said, I'm not, I'm not doing this. So we then went to our bookstore, and this is where they got very helpful, and said, here's all the McGraw-Hill users that we're aware of. And we walked down our own bookstores list, and that's how we got stuff done. Um, we ended up with 19, uh, 18 courses, 14 faculty. Um, class sizes range from 18 to 80. And it's a wide variety of disciplines, engineering, econ, uh, sociology, stat, kinesiology, biology, journalism, English, communications management, just quite a, a wide range. At Wichita State University, we targeted the early adopters. We run a training session uh, biannually for faculty who are interested in teaching online. It's a five-day intensive workshop. And so we, I went to them first, since they're the faculty that I have the most contact with. And uh, out of the 80 some odd faculty that have gone through that, we got about 12 or so who were initially interested. And then we started whittling it down, realizing that some of them couldn't do other publishers or there wasn't a textbook that they were interested in adopting. So at some point, we ended up with about five or six faculty members. And at that point, I went to the bookstore. That's after our conversation with the bookstore. Well, went to McGraw-Hill. McGraw-Hill uh, provided us with a complete list of all of the McGraw-Hill texts on campus. No, sorry, let me back up. They didn't provide that. They provided a complete list of all digital titles. And that's the best they could do for us. So we sent that to the bookstore, and the bookstore at this point, had, we'd already had our conversation, within a week's time came back with an annotated list of everybody who's using one of those books. And so, I mean, our bookstore was, it was highly effective in helping us to determine the best. They didn't, say, they didn't say any of these are not, you know, that they all were possibilities. They didn't make us, like Jim's, uh, keep hands off of certain courses. So we went, I went down the list and I started emailing people and saying, you know, are you interested? Are you interested? And, and most of the emails went to nothing. One of them said, well, I'm, I'm not really teaching online. And I, I tried to write back and say, well, it's not about teaching online. It's about participating in an e-textbook. And then it just, we didn't get anybody else. So even after all the work the bookstore did for us, we ended up with the people who originally were contacted who were early adopters in technology anyway. And uh, at that point, we met uh, with the CIO, who himself teaches a, a class still on routing and switching in the computer science department. And he said, I want my class to be a part of this. So even though he hadn't done it before, um, he's not a McGraw-Hill user. He's, he asked me to look for a text for him. And we found one that would work. And so he joined in the pilot. So up to that point, we had uh, probably in the class loads, we would have had about 700, maybe 600 or so. But his course was about 100. We added a course I teach. That's 20. So we ended up uh, overall with 16 sections and only eight faculty. One is the CIO and one's me. Um, so really, there are six that are you know, willing participants that um, are not really heavily involved in technology. And the class sizes range from 10, which is mine. Now I only have 10 students, to 90. Um, and that's not because we were limited. That's just the largest class sizes we have are about 90. We don't get huge class sizes at Wichita State. So. Uh, as of the, month, the Friday before our last drop date, we had 801 participants, which was, I was going to be so excited that we were going to maybe get one free. Um, and then uh, came the next day on drop day, we ended up with 790. So uh, we're probably closest to the limit that we could get without going over. We have a variety of fields, but the majority of them, about half of them, ended up in business. And that's partially because um, the subjects that were adopted at our campus using McGraw-Hill are largely business. We did have one hiccup. Um, about two weeks into the semester, one of our kind of what I would call a power user, she was doing an art history course, uh, resigned from the university and left her course to two other individuals, her two courses. She had two separate courses teaching the same subject. 
And one of them said, I don't want to have anything to do with this pilot, but I'm not going to take the book away from the students. This is not the textbook we normally use. I don't know why she went ahead and did this, because she was an, somebody who adopted a new textbook. And the other teacher was a brand new teacher, hired adjunct on the spot, basically had given her resume a few months earlier. And uh, you know when the other one resigned, she was called in to jump in at last minute's notice. So, She's been very interested in continuing the work and she's going to have her classes surveyed, but essentially we kind of had a hiccup and I thought we were going to lose about 200 participants um, because that was between the, the different sections. We were around 200 for that one class. So that's kind of where we ended up. Communication piece. Um, at Wichita State University, we were kind of a little bit late in getting things out. Uh, and then when we did, they kind of went out for full force, like a tidal wave. Um, first, we put out an announcement to the faculty and staff in a daily newsletter we have, which is called WSU Today. And um, didn't hear a lot of information from people, didn't really get much. But then, uh, working with university relations, we crafted a press release that went out. Um, and within a few days, uh, I was getting phone calls from local TV affiliates. One first one was an NS, uh, NBC affiliate, KSN, and the second one was um, after their story aired, another channel in town, the CBS affiliate didn't want to be left out of it, so they interviewed uh, a faculty member and a teacher. And I've got uh, some clips. Uh, the interesting thing is, is because they're all affiliates, the news feeds ended up in different places. So the top one I have is actually from Kansas City, which is about three hours away from us. The uh, four right now. Uh, Kansas University is testing out a program that could do away with textbooks. 800 students at Wichita State University are part of a pilot program testing out e-textbooks. The biggest perk may be the cost. It's about $20 to $30 per e-book. Compared to the traditional book, it can run anywhere from 200 bucks on up. Students are also excited about the convenience. My iPad is a lot lighter than most textbooks, so it's a lot nicer. My back doesn't feel as worn out if I just have to carry that around, or even just my computer instead of like three books. Be highlighted, or I could add Wichita notes. State is one of 276 schools selected for this program. This pilot program is limited to only textbooks published by McGraw Hill, so only certain courses can participate. 6:30. So that was. Sorry, let me go back. That one uh, originally was a three-minute piece, and they've shrunk it down. At least they kept the interview with the students so you could hear what her comments were. And that was our that was a room in our Media Resources Center, by the way. So I'm proud to have that here on uh, television in Kansas City and, and the Wichita metro area. The second one was a piece that was done because the first one interviewed the, the student and interviewed me. The second news affiliate decided they wanted to have more of the teacher angle. And so they interviewed one of the faculty members and a student. And then I had a, a little blurb. And I'll cut it off before mine because I'm here. If you have questions, I can, I can give you a sound bite. A group of Wichita State students have a lighter backpack this year. They're part of a pilot program at the school. Eyewitness News reporter Samantha Anderson tells us how it all works. The students in this classroom are part of a nationwide study. Educause and Internet 2 have put together a semester-long e-textbook pilot for universities across the nation. And 800 Wichita State students are part of the program. We didn't have to pay for them. Doesn't matter. students and teachers believe that it says a lot about the university. It says a lot about um, Dr. Ravi Pensy and his um, ability to have Wichita be known as kind of cutting edge when it comes to information systems. Students say the cutting edge technology has made studying easier. It's more convenient <clears throat> because I don't have the problem, you know, with you know, folding it. Several of them have told me that it's been nice because if they have a little downtime at work that they weren't expecting during lunch or something, they can actually end up reading some chapters even though they hadn't lugged their book to work. However, the lightweight electronic textbooks do take some getting used to. They're not used to reading on the screen, so the glare. And I have had some students who have wanted to go ahead then and get a printed copy. The success of the e-text will also help the university decide how it wants to implement online textbooks into the curriculum after the pilot ends. We're gonna help. Oh, that's me. <laughs> yes, I'm here. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Mark did a great job of getting press releases out and getting some local press 
uh, involved. Uh, I have difficulty on my campus getting my student newspaper to report anything. So um, our story is uh, quite a bit different. Um, unless it's actually at bars or at the stadium for the sporting event, maybe we should have the e-tex pilot at the stadium. Well, anyway, that's, so that's just an idea I just came up with. Um, our communication has been a lot more targeted. We're having a lot of dialogue with the specific uh, business process uh, process owners about the, uh, how this impacts um, our institution. And, and really, that, if you recall, that was our top goal, is to get everybody involved in that dialogue. Uh, it is a pretty rare day for me, personally, to be sitting in front of any one of our institutional vice presidents and talking about a specific technology that we're working with. And just a couple of uh, weeks ago, I sat in front of all the vice presidents and, and, and had that discussion with them. So it's working, having the pilot on our campus is working to have the dialogue, and that was our main goal. Uh, let's see, oh yes, the evaluation component. Um, so Internet 2 has what they call a baseline um, assessment that they started with the spring 2012 semester. Actually, a little bit of a misnomer. There's not a baseline that's taken ahead of the semester and then a comparison. They're really talking about a longitudinal study that they're trying to take over the course of a number of semesters. So they're really just looking at student satisfaction, how the faculty are utilizing it. And that component is, is um, uh, something that we will be participating in at Iowa State as will uh, Wichita State. They are also starting a new assessment, <clears throat> and this is led primarily by the users, uh, on how to impact teaching, how this impacts teaching and learning. That assessment's still coming together. We're not really sure what that's going to look like yet. Um, and so we're holding off just a little bit. Um, I don't want to over-survey our pilot courses, and so we need to see what that, what that looks like. But we're interested in participating in that. These uh, Internet 2 assessments are not required. Uh, your institution doesn't have to participate in them. I know a couple of other institutions, including one individual sitting here in the room is actually doing an assessment within, uh, doing their own assessment within their own institution. Um, Mark. As far as Wichita State and our, our using the assessment, the one thing I did need to say is I found out, I, I didn't think of this ahead of time because I'm a committee of one, uh, to find out how long our courses actually are. Well, two of them are eight week courses and they are ending now. And so since the internet too has not quite got the whole wording and everything done with the baseline, I've taken the baseline survey that they did from the spring pilot and I've surveyed on that. It's essentially, I, I ran that through our institutional review board back in the summer and got approval for it. So I'm going ahead and running it and it might be if they start changing wording that will change the results, then we're gonna have to bow out of the baseline. At this point, because of our eight week courses, the few that we've had, um, we can't participate in the teaching and learning assessment. So after I realized there was nothing uh, created yet, I knew we were, it was too late for us. Um, and now I've got a wonderful demonstration for you. I'm gonna switch screens here. I wanted to come at this from our learning management system, which is Blackboard 9. And essentially all this is, is it's a, a link. And from the link, the student clicks on the link and they're launched through an LTI uh, into the course load instance. So you're actually looking at course load right now and you're looking at our instance of it, which is called wichita.courseload.com. The student hasn't had to put in any other information, no passwords. They don't even know what a password is for getting into course load. So if I come up here to the corner and log out up here, they will be logged out and will have to go back through Blackboard to get back in. They can't log back into course load that way. Um, Essentially, it's broken into an area they called stacks over here. You can see all of the courses in which you were enrolled that are part of the, the course load test. I'm, since I'm running the pilot, I've got all of the courses here. But the one I wanted you to see today was a test because then that way I could mark it up and not start interfering with students seeing my annotations and thinking their instructors starting to highlight things that are important that actually aren't. Um, they have what they call stacks. And they can be broken up into different groups. You can call them whatever. But essentially, I'm just going to get into the textbook stack. And when you click on it, you see the pages uh, in the middle. And you can either zoom using the zoom tool, which essentially just gets rid of the sidebar items. Once you've zoomed to the ultimate level, that's as high as you can get. You can zoom out, too. I'm not exactly sure why you'd want to zoom to that level. It's Even on my screen, 
I, I can't even read it here on this screen. I can't read it on mine. So the, the zoom level pretty much is very limited. But from that point, you can actually start highlighting what you want. And it'll pop up this thing, and you can choose one of four colors, and you can add a note. And that note can be anything. So if I were an instructor, I could say, this is going to be on the test. You know, I could, I could put up something like that. And then I can tag it as well. I could say test or final. And so I could tag information with that. And then the students will see up on the left-hand side, when they scroll around to this page, they'll see the tag, and then they'll see my comment on it. They can also see other comments from other users within the class. In this case, I don't, I don't think we really have any that have really done anything, but um, let's see if, yeah, so here's, you can see all the annotations over here from the user Mark Porcaro, which is my other login as a student. You can see I've taken a note and I said, I don't understand this part. And essentially, as a student, uh, I'm able to ask questions to the instructor. And it'll pop up over on the left-hand side over here this little tiny green thing that says one new or 12 new or whatever, and it's essentially that many students have asked a question using the notes tool. From the student standpoint, instead of below where the tagline is, there's a little check mark that says is ask as a question. And it'll basically alert the teacher when they come into course load that there's a question they need to answer, and then they can answer it. And those answers and those questions are public to everybody in the course, unless the student has turned off that setting um, so the, as far as the note setting by default, the students, I believe, are a non-share setting, but they can share then their notes with the instructor. They can share their notes and annotations with the rest of the class. Um, and you can see where the notes are down on the bottom. It's kind of hard to see here, but there's these little dots that show where notes are actually. Somebody's either highlighted or annotated. And in the case of um, if you have a page, for instance, that has a picture and you want to highlight something in here, if there are no text, you can't highlight the text. But you can see in the picture, it's done a good job of actually finding where text is in that picture. And so I can highlight the text. But if there's a picture where it's kind of uh, mostly just a picture, you can just do a sticky note, essentially. And you just create a note wherever you want. And then you add your little note and say, you know, here's a great chart for understanding this particular concept. So as a teacher, as a student, you have the same basic interface. There's not a lot of difference. The one difference for the student is they have the ability to change their sharing settings. Uh, for the instructor, they have this nifty little tool. And this is probably, I think, one of the powerful points of course load compared to, say, the social uh, tools where they can share notes is the stats, where you can actually get in and see who's reading. And here we have, um, I'll go ahead and show you. In my course, I'm not going to roll over the names, but if I rolled over, it'll show you the names of who is actually reading and how many pages they've done. So you can kind of see there's somebody that's read a little over 250 pages of the textbook. And this is a good way for me, especially as an instructor, to be able to say to a student, it's no wonder you didn't do well on that last test. You've read 25 pages. We're 150 pages in. I actually did use that. I said. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I can see how many pages you've read. And honestly, I didn't get a response back. She hasn't increased her page rate, reading rate, so I, <laughs> I don't think it made that much of a difference with her. It's a click. So it doesn't really know whether they spent five seconds or two hours on that page. There's no instance of that. So they have another tool that essentially says who's engaged within that course. And this one shows you who's taken notes. And you can see they have notes, highlights, or annotations. And the notes are the tool that I showed you where you could type in a note. The annotation is when you have something where they've just put um, a sticky note somewhere on the page. And the highlights are then whenever they've highlighted text. So you can see how much of the text they've actually done. So this is the way that you can see if they're engaged because they're actually doing this. But of course, not all students study that way. Some of them don't feel that they want to mark up the text that way, they might take question, They might take notes another way.
Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, one of the other things that they can do is they can print any and every page up to 50 at a time. So they, if they had a 300-page textbook, they can print all of those pages on their own if they want at their own cost. And that's part of course load. There's no restriction on it. Essentially what it does is when they go to print out, on the left-hand side of the page, um, it has a barcode over here with their email address on it. So they couldn't try to sell it to another person. I don't know that you could. Um, I have not heard word from anybody, but I think that's, what's that? Haven't done a follow-up study on it yet at our campus. You, any? At least in ours, our, it's, the cost is per student. The student pays seven to 10 cents is something a page. So it'll become very expensive for them to print out a 300 page text. You know, it, it, the cost will go up pretty quickly. So at the beginning, the one thing I didn't show you because the other one didn't have it, but there is a link to the print on demand copy um, that the student can see. The other thing you're seeing here in this, this is actually a beta that they're running. It's a, you, I don't know if you saw this. This is a reading assignments tool. When they first log into your textbook, they see what the reading assignment is for that week. And it links to a particular quiz that's due during a particular time. So for that to work, I had to actually give my syllabus to course load and they put this in. I didn't have anything to do with this at this point. They asked for specific dates and specific quizzes that I was running and what chapters would be on that quiz and then they put up this little tool. But otherwise, it's, it's not a fully functional part of it. But I did want to show you that piece. Um, are there any questions about this particular? Or you had another question. Uh, through Blackboard, that mobile learn, no. What, well, what happens is it would pass them on to the internet browser. So it would be the, you know, the iOS Safari version. Uh, and that is limited in its functionality. On a phone, it is unusable. It's just the, the size that the print ends up being is so small that you can't really zoom it. Um, you can't even do you know, a, a pinch zoom to make it work. On an iPad, it is usable, but the problem is, is it's not touch friendly. So when they go to touch it to move around to navigate, it starts highlighting immediately. So I, I found out if you put two fingers down, it sees that as something different and it uses as a navigation, whereas one finger is a highlight. So it's not touch friendly at all and it doesn't respond the way you would with a normal e-text on a touch device where you swipe and it moves the page. It doesn't do that because you have to use the, the left and right page controls or the scrobbler down here, which oh, I didn't really show you, but actually shows you a highlight of what is on that page. So it's the same functionality here because it's HTML5. So as long as the browser on your mobile device is HTML5 compatible, it should run, but it's limited functionality. This, I'll just throw in a, a note, this is really evolving very quickly. There are uh, changes that CourseLoad has made in, in features and functionality that have happened throughout the summer and now they're doing, as Mark mentioned, some beta testing of some new functions. So uh, sometimes I always, uh, people ask me, well, does it do this? And I have to go back and check the release notes from last week to see if that got added because I'd, it, it, it's all happening very rapidly. Uh, some student observations so far. Um, Students are happy with the free text, who wouldn't be, right? Um, and as far as we're concerned at Iowa State, that's sort of their reward for being guinea pigs for us. Uh, I think if they had to pay for this, we would have different attitudes. And part of the, um, uh, part of the requirement of the pilot with McGraw-Hill, in fact, there's one other university that was involved in the spring that has continued this pilot, but they moved it to the, the traditional bookstore model where the students now go back and pay for it. But the, uh, one of the requirements from McGraw Hill is that you have to have 100% participation in the course. The student has to buy the e-text. Well, that's, I mean, when have you ever known every student in a course to buy the textbook? 
They're either borrowing it from you know their, their friend, somebody down the hall, or picking up a copy at the library or something. So that, that's a pretty significant issue, I think, that would, needs to be addressed. Um, obviously, searchability just becomes easier uh, in electronic medium. As Mark mentioned, there's no, um, uh, it's not really very touch friendly on mobile devices. You expect to scroll just by swiping your finger, but no, you have to go to the scroll bar and grab it. And by the way, if you don't grab it just right, you've got to go back and try it again. It's really not very usable on iOS. I'm assuming that that will improve, but we haven't seen it yet. Um, there's the standard issues of screen fatigue and, and glare. Um, the text themselves, uh, by and large, are poorly designed for screen reading. Uh, the publishers are taking, at least McGraw-Hill in this case, is taking a relatively easy way out. Here's a print copy of the text, and we're going to give you an electronic copy that looks exactly the same. And it's in two columns, and now I've got to read down on my screen, read down this column, and then I've got to scroll back up and read down this column. If you've read two column uh, text on a screen, then you know that's a hassle. Um, so it's not really formatted for online reading yet. That, the publishers just haven't got there. Um, there's no real offline access. If you use Google Chrome, you can download the e-text um, and basically check it out and read it online. And you have it checked out for a couple of weeks. Excuse me, read it offline. But it's a really cumbersome process to do and, and not one that our faculty are finding very usable. Some students are using it, but not much. And that's Google Chrome on a laptop only. Yes. Google yes. Chrome doesn't do extensions. It has a particular extension they have to load to make it work. Right. Oops. I went too far. Um, faculty observations, as you saw, you saw a little bit from one faculty member who she's fairly pleased with it. She, the, the biggest thing they like is to be able to see statistics when what the students are reading, at least they're clicking through on pages. Um, that you can annotate for further clarity. One of our power users before she quit was doing this in her classroom. That was how she was engaging the students. She was, you know, every week she would pose a different question or sets of questions based on the reading. Um, there's, uh, some of the things they noticed is that the students aren't using the social functionality that much yet. So basically the students are taking notes, but they're not sharing their notes with one another or commenting on each other's notes, or the students aren't really availing themselves of that. The biggest thing that I think we've found is that the difference between McGraw-Hill Connect, which we've explained to you, and course load, which you've seen, um, is creating problems with not only faculty, but students. In the surveys that I've run already, I've seen a number of handwritten comments at the end that have said, I really, you know, the e-text was okay, but what I loved were the flashcards. And you've seen course load, there are no flashcards. So obviously the students are getting confused about what the e-text is. They don't know the difference between course load and McGraw-Hill Connect. And on top of it, McGraw-Hill Connect is a very unstable product. Um, they have constant downtimes about once a week. And there are a number of problems with synchronizing scores and things like that with the LMS. So I've been pulling my hair out. I guess I was fully, I had more hair before this started. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had the same amount, I think. But I've had to troubleshoot a lot of problems um, with one particular faculty member whose uh, McGraw-Hill Connect account seems to be causing a lot of problems with the students. And that's a known issue that McGraw-Hill has with Connect. It's not fully developed. Uh, administratively, if I have to give grades to working with uh, McGraw-Hill and course load, uh, McGraw-Hill is a D at this point. They've been pretty difficult, frankly, and they're, and they're just not very friendly to work with. One instance where we were using Connect, I had to get codes for the students because, right, they said they'd provide it for free, right? And I'm sending notes going, do we have those codes yet? Do we have those codes yet? It actually became a daily part of my regi regimen. Turn on the computer, get coffee, nag McGraw-Hill. And after about 10 days of that, I finally got a note that said, look, it's a busy time of the semester for us. We're working on it. I, no kidding. It's kind of busy for us, too, here. We're trying to hold a class with your product. So I'm um, not crazy about that. Course load, on the other hand, has been very helpful and has helped us solve a lot of problems and has been very responsive. So I, I really like that product and what they're doing with it. Um, the support staff burden uh, on uh, we set up helplines and we had people sort of standing by because we didn't know what technology issues we'd be running into. There really haven't been that many. Uh, on the student side of things, the very few students that have contacted us, it ended up being a local issue on their computer. It wasn't anything to do with the technology being used. Faculty were trying to do a little bit more support to help them use the social features and were real hit and miss on whether they're doing any uptake on that, as you would probably expect. 
Um, I would say that the e-publishing industry in general is not ready for prime time. Um, this is a group of people that I think are still, I'm generalizing here, I realize, but a number of publishers just aren't ready to deal with this electronic world. Uh, another product, not McGraw-Hill, but another publisher has a product similar to this and they're doing things like um, passing uh, passwords in clear text. I mean, that's so 90s, right? So uh, there, some of these things just aren't quite worked out yet and it's gonna take some time to get there. And who knows what the business model is gonna be um, and, and whether the students are gonna embrace that or not. So time will tell. I'll throw in one additional comment uh, because there's been developments le uh, lately. Um, the National Federation for the Blind has expressed some concern about uh, the usability of these. Um, they have been in dialogue with Educause and with the Internet too. They're going back and forth about uh, whether this is an appropriate technology to utilize. And there's a lot of stuff posted that you can read online about their dialogue back and forth. Some of it a little bit on the tent side, I would say. I will simply tell you that we, have, we are aware of one visually impaired student in the Iowa State pilot and we have checked with her repeatedly and she is having no difficulty using the product. Her JAWS screen reader is working fine. Whatever works with the NFB and Educause and Internet 2 will sort itself out over time, but we're not having any problems right now. And we haven't had any issues with, on our campus either. Like I said, we've contacted Disability Services and tried to be proactive and they're having student workers test it out. I haven't heard anything back yet. I'm hoping we'll have more conversation in our dialogue on Wednesday. Um, McGraw-Hill, one of the other things I did need to mention is when the pilot first started, uh, we contacted the sales rep hoping he could give us some lists of people that are using McGraw-Hill. And he said to me, what pilot? <laughs> and I said, um, there's a big pilot, Educause and Internet 2, and we've been uh, invited to participate. And he said, what about my commission? And I said, I don't know. I know nothing about this. I, I have nothing to do with that. You'll have to talk to your supervisors. And then we had a phone call with some of the supervisors and they said, we're sorry, we just didn't really communicate very well with our sales reps what was going on with the pilot. So they didn't really apologize that they put me in that position and that they put their sales rep in that position. They just kind of said, we're sorry that we did it. But um, it was a little frustrating. But I do have to say, course load, I've been incredibly impressed with. Uh, for a small company, they are working day and night to try to resolve problems. We did have one issue where there was a, a problem one night it was like a Friday night, I all of a sudden got a, an email from one of our faculty members saying, my students are, can't connect. And so I went and checked and, and lo and behold, yes, his wasn't passing through properly. And so we got in hold of him and I was in an email conversation with somebody from McGraw-Hill, no, it was Saturday night. Saturday night at about midnight, which is about one o'clock their time, he was still communicating with me trying to fix the problem. And he said, I don't, I'm not gonna be able to resolve this right now, but I'll try to get back to you in the morning. So Sunday morning he wrote me and said, we've got it fixed, we figured out what the problem was. So I was very impressed with them that they would keep going on with that. Um, we had a few slides at the end that were results from the, the spring survey and I'm not going over these, don't worry. <laughs> um, I wanted to put them up there so when you get a hold of the slide deck, you can kind of review. These are some of the key points that came through the report that was issued from Internet2 and Educause about the spring 2012 pilot. The, the spring pilot that had those five institutions. Yeah, that had the five institutions. So we're expecting that we're gonna see very similar results in our surveys. And so far I can tell you it's running about the same with the two courses I've done so far. I haven't correlated all the data yet, but um, we're seeing a lot of uh, the same issues that some of the students like paper copies better than they do e-texts. That's what I've already seen. So um, some of them like some of the flexibility but it's going to be a mixed bag, and I think it's going to, we're going to find that it's a little bit middle of the road, and some of these scores are a mean of a little bit less than the middle. So we're finding that they're a little bit on the negative side um, on some of these issues. Some of them are a little higher, like the future of the textbooks. 88% they found use the textbook, the e-textbook, sorry, in the, in the pilot. And I think we'll find probably about the same numbers um, when we get down to our actual data. So, um, the, no, they don't use it very much, but they, did, they didn't buy. It, the question was worded something like, I purchased a paper copy, or yes or no, something like that. Um, and so, it's really, did you purchase it? And 88% didn't. So, do you have questions of us now? And try to give you the broad overview.
So Sandy's question, is are students allowed to bring laptops into the class? Um, and I think that probably varies quite a bit by, uh, by faculty member. Frankly, at our institution, if you had 100% uh, penetration of technology devices in the student hands, you would not get a stable wireless connection because we just don't have that kind of coverage in most of our classrooms. So I, a lot of this is really stuff that's happening asynchronously, so not necessarily happening synchronously in class. Right, right. Some, in some of our classes, they're allowed to do that. In fact, one instructor at ours, she does use the textbook in class, so she'd actually display it on the screen. I know that because uh, she had a, a room where they were using, um, they, everything's locked down in the computer, in the, in the master classroom, and it's using IE8, and IE8 is not fully HTML5 compliant, so every time she'd go in, she'd have to download Chrome and install it before she taught the class. And so I had to call up the, the rep for that room who's not part of our group, he's part of the business school, and had to tell him, you've got to do something different because she's having to load Chrome every single time she comes in and wants to use it. So he was going to work on it and maybe even upgrade to IE9, maybe. So these, these are some of the local business, I mean, not, sort of not really pedagogically related, but the local process issues that we're running into. Yeah. There's a hand back there. We've, we've literally told our faculty, please don't make your students use this on an iPad at this point because they're going to get very frustrated. Yeah. I'm paying two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. This better be working right. Yeah. Hmm. Be interesting to see all the all the different things you brought into that calculation which I'm sure we don't have time for now, but I'm curious about that. Yeah, Jennifer. made an observation, um, and I, afterwards I felt really stupid for saying this in front of the, my three vice presidents I was talking to, but I said, this is really a publisher-driven pilot, and you'd sit there and go, well, duh, and you should get that figured out before. But seriously, they're trying to all shove this through a current business model, or maybe even a business model that loops out your local bookstore. 
Um, it starts to get more interesting to me. What do we do next if we're starting to talk more about open educational resources and bringing this content in in different ways outside of that process? So whether will it participate in the spring 2013 pilot at Iowa State is still a question that we have. But I know from what I've dealt with so far, I'm actually more interested in an OER type pilot next than anything else. Uh, I haven't gotten that sense from McGraw-Hill course load. The limited discussions I've had with the developers, um, they're aware, uh, they're trying to work into the future of possibly building an app, who knows what. You know, they're still looking at what that future is. They, they know the limitations and they're, um, they're trying to work around that. But as long as the material is given to them in a two-column format, then it's never going to be reformatable. So it has to come from McGraw-Hill that way. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, Probably about out of time. Any last question or? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you.